and welcome to Encompass Live. Um, I am your host, Krista Burns. Um, Encompass Live is Nebraska Library Commission's weekly event that we do via the Centra online um, software. Um, we cover all sorts of NLC activities, library topics you may be interested in, um, presented by NLC staff, and we do have guest speakers come in sometimes. We've got a few of those. Um, it's where we do this every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Central Time. It is for about an hour or however long it lasts. And um, it is free, so um, you can watch it live here for free, and you can watch the recordings for free as well. Um, this morning, we have a session on setting up your public access computers. Uh, Michael Sowers and Diana Wells are going to go through that, so I will turn things over to you guys to take it away. Take it away. All right. And, okay. and you can have control. <laughs> um, this is Michael Sowers. I'm the technology innovation librarian here at the commission. Many of you have taking classes from me or heard me on our podcast or various things like that. And I'll let Diane introduce Whoa. herself. Hello. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Our camera operators having issues. Anyway, I'm Diane Wells. Diane Wells. I'm part of the Library Commission's computer team. And uh, we did one of these sessions a few weeks ago um, talking about purchasing computer stuff. And I remember at the end we got a question or two about some security issues. And so we just decided, hey, why don't we do one of those? So we've kind of put together a PowerPoint here for you. Uh, we've got some opinions. We don't always agree. Um, and that's half the fun, I think, in, in many times. Um, and so we're going to kind of go through this, the, the uh, material we have. Um, we have no control over this camera at the moment, for those of you watching the live yes, session. Really. Uh, it's getting a little uh, uh, drunk in there. Yeah, um, <laughs> Are you sure you're not on the medication, Krista? No, I'm not. Okay, all right. Some, some of the rest of us are here. Uh, yeah. We're feeling a little under the weather. Anyways, um, so we're going to go through kind of our material, the PowerPoints here. If you've got questions at any point, just go ahead and give a hand raise there, and then we're hoping to leave kind of plenty of time at the end because some of you may have some situations that we either hadn't thought of or we hadn't covered, and we will do our best to answer your questions. So I'm going to start out with here. Um, both Diane and I deal with security kind of at different levels. Um, I usually look at it from the end user point of view. Uh, Diane usually looks at it from kind of the behind the scenes server right. stuff and um, managing the desktops and things like that. But what we can both agree on is that ultimately it is all about balance. You have to balance security with usability. Right. Um, you can have a completely usable computer that does everything you could possibly want it to do, but it's highly insecure. Um, you can also have uh, severely secure computers uh, that unfortunately are not usable. As I was told once a completely secure computer is one that is unplugged, not connected to a network, locked in a closet, uh, no lights on, and a key has been lost. Perfectly secure computer, Absolutely. but Useless. not exactly usable. Um, so, for example, it is possible to kind of overdo your security, I, I would argue. I do love this photo. Mark. Yes, uh, I've, I've seen this photo used in many uh, different presentations over the years. So I went out and found it. So, like we said, it's a balance. There are not necessarily any right or wrong answers. We have some strategies. We have some suggestions. But they might not all apply to you in particular or your scenario. So uh, let's go ahead and just talk about some general strategies. Dan, do you want to run through these? Sure. Um, basically, you want to be sure that your um, public access computers don't allow aren't set up to boot from anything except um, the hard drive. Um, that's set in the BIOS. It's a really quick, to get into the BIOS, it's a really quick keystroke um, before you actually, before the operating system loads. And then um, there's, the menus vary in how they look, but they're basically always like white text on a black screen kind of thing. And you page through and it allows you to um, choose what things can and can't be um, like, can it boot from the hard drive? Yes, that's what you want. Do you want it to boot from a network? Probably not. Most public access computers are not networked in a way that would make that make any sense. Um, do you want it to be boot from a flash drive? No. Or a floppy? No. You don't want to do those things because that would allow people to basically boot your computer from some other, um, from some other way. You probably do want to have some sort of a boot order in case you have a 
really horrible crash and maybe able to want to be able to boot to a CD at some point. But the next point kind of give, keeps you covered there. You want to set a BIOS password. Now, it's not something that you generally do, but in these cases, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. So that um, once you hit that key that it says, you know, F2, F whatever, depending on what operating, what kind of computer you have, it's going to be different. Once you hit that, it's going to ask you for a password. And, that, and you want to keep that password um, in a place where people know where it is because there's, I mean, where you know where it is, a safe place that your predecessor will, no, not your predecessor, your successor. Your successor, yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> allergy medicine is really doing an effort on me today. Um, anyway, um, so they will know where that is. Um, so um, basically that's the thing about the BIOS is that you want to be able to, to set that up so that you know how it is, that it's possible to change it, but that you're the only one so you can change it. Yeah, I'll throw in here for, for those of you not familiar with BIOS, she mentioned a, a key press. Usually it's when you first turn on the computer, it will say something like press F2 for setup. That's that's the BIOS. That, that, that's, that's where you're going in there. The BIOS, now, it might right. not be F2. It might be another keystroke. You know, it varies from, from really does maker vary. to maker. Also, the what, what typically the BIOS will allow you to do, um, I've seen some BIOSes that do the allow from boot yes or no. Um, right. A lot of BIOSes will also set what's called the boot order. Right. And you want to make sure that the hard drive is first. Now, for security purposes, that's great. That way I or somebody else can't come up, stick in my flash drive, and boot a completely different operating system on your computer. But that can cause a problem eventually when you go to use, say, your Windows recovery disk right. and you need to boot from the CD-ROM. Well, you'll have to remember that you listed the hard drive first, go back in, change it so that the CD-ROM is first, and then you can boot from, say, a recovery disk or something like that. Yes. And the setting of the BIOS password just basically prevents somebody else from changing your boot order. Right. That used to that. Okay, Michael, this public should not run as admin. Now, this is your, I mean, this is, this is, this is sort of the place where we need to talk about the things that, that we don't always agree on. Um, and, and, and because there is no real right and, right and steadfast wrong to this kind of thing, um, generally I'd say that, you know, you don't want your public running as administrator. Um, you don't want them to be able to install software. You don't want them to be able to make major changes to your machine. So, um, the maybe unless we'll cover in a little bit, there are some programs that make it possible for um, you to go ahead and let your public run as an admin, and then none of their changes will be saved. So that's what the maybe unless is all about. Yeah, but I would agree. A general rule of thumb, unless you've got some additional software, would be don't let the public run as an admin. I, yeah. I mean that that is you know perfectly acceptable uh, unless you've taken additional steps. A lot of additional steps, say. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, so Patch Tuesday. I, I love my little pirate guy here. Um, <laughs> I, I want to throw a quick yes or no here. Let's make this a little interactive. Check your yes or no if you know what I'm talking about when I say Patch Tuesday. Okay, we got one yes, one no. Okay, there's there's nine of you out there. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, there's eight of you out there. And there's a room full of NLC staff somewhere in this building watching. <laughs> so most of them, maybe, I don't know, let's, well, let's see if we can find out what their answer was. Okay, we've got... Um, and I'll see us saying yes, good. I know some of the computer people are, yeah. are in the room, so, so they're going to check it. Okay, it's about a 50-50 split. The point of this slide is the following. You need to run your software updates. You need to install the security patches. Um, if you're running Windows, if you're running Mac, even Macs have security patches. Yes. Um, much of the other software, um, Java has been updating a lot lately. Firefox has had a security update lately. Um, there's a new version of Internet Explorer, which you may or may not want to be updating lately. Um, but Patch Tuesday is Microsoft's day every month. It's the second Tuesday of the month where they release all of their updates and security patches. Now, they will periodically release them um, on other days, but you can pretty much bet that the second Tuesday of every month there's going to be a bunch of updates for your computer. So what I generally recommend is mark that on your calendar, and then sometime later in that week, you know, you might need to wait till the weekend, you might need to wait until uh, Friday, something like that, but make sure that um, if your computers aren't automatically updating, which is a whole other issue, um, which the public issues may or may not be, that you go and you get those patches. Absolutely. 
so it's the, it's the best thing you can do for any of any system. And honestly, at this point, I haven't heard of a patch screwing up a machine lately. I mean, it's it's, it's been a while. Yeah, you pretty much can get those patches, and it's not going to cause problems. Uh, there's always exceptions to everything, but right. you know. But percentage-wise, you're just much you're much more likely to have a problem if you have it patched. Up. Right. Exactly. So. Um, the other one we like to talk about is, is reducing temptation. Um, I, I usually talk to a libraries where they have a, a public login and they have an admin public uh, admin login, which makes complete sense. Um, and then they go and they, they name their admin login admin. <laughs> Um, staff. Yeah, or staff. Although I will admit, I've I've named them staff before. As if anybody got any of some of the Gates machines, but you know, maybe you should have your username be something other than the obvious admin or staff. Um, it's just kind of you know, you're a 15 year old. You're not necessarily malicious, but you sit down in front of that computer and you see a thing that says, "Click here to log in as administrator." What are you going to click on? I mean, it's, you're yeah. going to give it a shot. Um, Got to spend at least you know 35 minutes trying to. Trying, it out. you know, you know. It, it might work, it might not. Um, yeah, I had one library suggest they they called it like you know for children only or something like that, and you know none of the teenagers would go near that <laughs> login. Um, so because you know what, how Clever cool would that be? Exactly. Is, really. um, so you know it's it's just reducing the temptation for people to play around with your system. They're going to do it. Um, you know, it's not necessarily malicious, but you know, people are curious and they're gonna try it. It's a computer, so why not? All right, what's next? Oh, passwords. The lovely, love lovely passwords. passwords. Um, this is where I, in in my security workshop, I said we're gonna have the talk. <laughs> um, we're gonna have the passwords talk. Many of you have had the passwords talk. Um, a slide I didn't throw in here was like the the most popular passwords. And oh. uh, just, you know, I usually the most popular password is the word password. I, I love that mm -hmm. one. Uh, or just the username again. The username again, uh, ABC123, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, a, a question, let's do this interactive again. Yes or no, do you use the same password for everything or a lot of your, of, of your things? Or are you sure you have a different password for everything? Okay, so we got one person saying... Uh, Yes to using the same password for everything. Two no's, three no's. All right, some of you are really, really good. Five no. Oh, we're doing great. Okay, I, I'm, this I'm, is good news. I, I can't see who's saying what, so I won't name names. But right. for, for the person who's using the same password for everything, stop. Um, or at least have a different password for your bank account. Um, <laughs> really? At a minimum, I mean, completely have a different and password. Maybe we were, they were strictly talking about, you know, work and life or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we I'm very I, specific I, about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's 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 do the little thing here. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, but that says passwords are like pants. Uh, it's a British sign. Uh, um, you shouldn't uh, leave them hanging around where anybody can see them. Uh, you shouldn't share them. Uh, you shouldn't, and you should change them regularly. Is a thing, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the change regularly in a minute, where we might have a, a, another slight disagreement. But um, we'll say uh, password size does matter in this case. Uh, the longer the password, the better. Of course, the longer the password, the harder it is to remember. We'll yes. talk about that. Um, but on average, my passwords run about ten characters long. Yeah. Diane, ten to fifteen. 10, ten to fifteen. Yeah. Um, and for those of you thinking, okay. but how do I remember that? We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, Almost everywhere, passwords are case sensitive. So, mix up or more case. Yeah. Um, definitely a good idea. Uh, mix in some numbers. Mix in punctuation and symbols. Um, you know, throw in shift and those number keys in there. Uh, can do that. And uh, spatial, spaces are usually allowed in, in, in many uh, places, especially like the Windows login and, and right. various things. Um, I have a password on my. Uh, Wi-Fi at home that is 63 random characters long. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chris is giving me a look like, Who doesn't want teenager in his house messing with a number? Yeah, well... <laughs> I think that might be... Um, I'm it, it guessing, is, just, just guessing, Michael. It's overkill. I, admit, I did it because I could, <laughs> um, but so then I keep that password on my flash drive, 
And so it's so you don't have to type it either. No, oh no, but I did have to type it in once, twice. Uh, I, I hooked up my uh, the iPod Touch to my Wi-Fi network at home, and you can't copy and paste into that. So I actually I've seen had that more to, and more. From- I, I well, the new iPod coming out, you will be able to copy. Oh and paste. really? Yep, they've added that. But anyways, um, so I did have to type in those 63 completely random characters, and I got it right on the first try. I was I, I figured I was going to try it once. Okay. And if it didn't work. Do we have an applause button? <laughs> Yes, we do. We have an applause button. Okay, Michael needs applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, um, I will admit it was overkill. Actually, I did it mainly just because I could do it. Wouldn't anything else. There we go. Thank you, Deb. Uh, yes, and and whoever else is applying. Um, so, really, the more of these bullet points you use, the better your password's going to be. It's right. really that simple. So, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily do all of them. But really, if you can do about three of those, I would say you're 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 well on the right track to right. having good passwords. Um, now, the changed often. Uh, here at the state, we have certain passwords we need to change every, what, 90 days? There are all like kinds that. of rules, yes. All kinds of rules. Uh, Diane, do you have an opinion on, on password changing? I don't know what it is, I'm asking here. Um, actually, my opinion is um, the more, just passwords in general, not specifically to your public access workstations, my opinion is the more access that this person that this this account has the more um essentially the more damage that particular account could do to your system then the more frequently the password ought to be changed and the better the password needs to be and so levels of password protection make sense to me um strictly from that standpoint a more limited account has access to um fewer things than you know maybe doesn't have to be changed quite so often. And the most limited accounts um, for like basically over a network, that kind of thing, then I would say those maybe don't need to be changed really often. However, here we're dealing with public access computers. So you've got a, a large group of people using them, knowing whatever password that you might put on them. In that case, then I would think that um, changing passwords might be a good thing. Um, it's as if you go back to the slide too, because balance is everything. You really have to, and I probably I will say this at every podcast I'm ever ever on, because it's what I really believe. I mean, it's it's balancing usability and risk and liability, and you have to you have to figure it out, and you have to figure it out in your environment with your equipment, with your software, with your public. And it's something that you don't need to do alone. Um, you can, there's a lot of advice out there. You can make a presentation to your board. You can come up with a policy. And I think that's what makes sense is to have done that so that you know what you're doing and why. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, so it boils down to it depends. <laughs> Absolutely. But not, in a, not, in a, not necessarily a layhard way. It basically depends on a thought for mm-hmm. life. Yeah, um, I I gotta admit I, I agree with everything Diane just said. Being forced to change my passwords frustrates the heck out of me. Um, I, I me too. I've read studies where if you have a bad password, you tend to change it to another bad password. If you have a good password, you tend to change it to another good password. So statistically, changing it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, uh, I've I will admit I've done the change the password and just up the number on the end was three last time now it's four and then it's five and then it's six and you can see it's not really any more secure it's just a different password. I find it really bizarre that there are places that will allow you that that force you to change your password every thirty days, but will allow you to make it the same thing plus one. Yeah. So plus um, two. Plus three. I'm like what? Yeah. I don't get it. So. Okay. Um, for those of you who are looking for good passwords but are thinking um, those are really hard to come up with, I just threw one piece of software here. Uh, I'm a Firefox user. I think there, there are standalone packages available yeah, for this. This one just adds right into Firefox. I get a menu choice. I click on Create Secure Password under the Tools menu, and it says, okay, I click Create. I can copy to my clipboard. I can tell it to whether I want to use one hand or both hands. We have to type the password uh, over in the settings there. I can tell it how long I want it to be. Do I want it to use letters, numbers, other characters? Are there certain characters I want it to exclude? Um, and how many more or less of, of waiting? So 
if I need a password for something and I'm, I decide not to use the system we're going to talk about next, uh, I will use this to create a password. Mm -hmm. For example, I had to create some passwords for other people recently. So I didn't want to use my system because that would be telling them what my system is. Uh, so I use this to generate some passwords uh, to uh, give to them in this case. I, would, I do want to say with this that um, one of the things that I do, and I think it's really, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. If it's a password that you're going to be typing a lot, then open up Notepad, type that password. Type it a lot of times. Change to a character that makes more sense. Put a shift in when you need a little bit of a little extra time to get your other hand over. I mean, make make a capital. Do you know? Make it a, make it a password that's gonna make it typable. You know, <laughs> even though it's you know, yes, we randomly generated it and whatever. That doesn't mean you can't change it. You can adapt that randomly generated or however you generated it to the point where it's typable for you. And um, because I have had passwords, I actually have a password and account now that I probably mistype half the time. <laughs> now you think I just change it, but I haven't got it run I just <laughs> go back in and retype it because I know I must have screwed it up somehow. But that is really a making your passwords typeable is a big deal. And you might as well just get out Notepad and type it a few times and say, that doesn't work very well. What if I do this? What if I change it to this number? What if, you know, what actually works the way that you type it? Yeah, and that, that happened to me. I have a password for, for one site that uses the uh, caret symbol and it shows shift six, for those of you who do it with keyboards in front of you. And I went to access that website on my cell phone. And it, so it's asking me to type my password. Well, the cell phone keyboard doesn't have that character. So I have to press about six more buttons to find the insert symbol screen that has that car character on it to be able to just type it into my password. And I realize not typical for most people, but I, I really should change that password because on the phone, it's really annoying. <laughs> and I thought I was being creative by using a carrot and a password. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, there we go. Right. Um, oh, so, well, let's do one, one, yes. one other quick point. Um, Punctuation marks are great, they're wonderful. I would really suggest you stay away from the period and the comma. Okay. If there are passwords that anybody's gonna have, that you're ever gonna have to read off of anything, because it's really hard to see them. Okay, yeah, the small They are characters. very difficult to see. Okay. And so then you go through and you're typing this password and you're like, well, I typed it and you didn't. And then you end up copying it somewhere and pasting it and you, you know, by the time you get it in 72 font, you realize, oh, look, there was, a, there was a period in there, and I just missed it. And so I try to stay away from them, because there's just no, if, if you're going to have to look it up and give it to somebody for some reason, because it's just really hard to do. Sure. Um, here's, you should see on the screen now our, our, our strategy, and I've been telling people about this one for years, and I've heard many people high up in the computer security world yes. give this exact same sort of methodology for creating really good passwords. Now, I want to stress down at the bottom there, the last bullet point is, I'm keeping the example simple. You then mix all that other stuff we talked about in to make it even better. But for example, come up with a phrase that you can remember. And, and I've actually used this one in the past. I don't use it anymore, which is, I don't like changing my passwords. Um, so then what I did was I turned that into I-D-L-C-M-P-W. You know, treating passwords as two words in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and then using that as my core, then customized it to each site. So for example, for Amazon, I would add an A on the front and a Z on the end. For Facebook, I would add an F on the front and a B on the end. Or put them both on the front or both on the end or something to that effect. Um, and then come up with a strategy for, you know, in whatever I type in L, I'm going to do it in uppercase instead of lowercase or lowercase instead of uppercase. What, however else you are good, you know, thinking about all the numbers and the symbols and whether it's typable on your keyboard, things like that. And I use a strategy very similar to this. And usually within two tries, if I can't remember the password, I can guess what my password is because it's based on this strategy that I've put together. Now, sometimes it doesn't work because I haven't used a symbol and they require me to use a symbol. So then I have to, you know, eventually I, I have been known to do the I can't remember my password thing in a website. Um, but I, I used a strategy very similar to what I'm describing here and it works generally well and now I have unique passwords for almost every single site I've signed up for. Um, 
and uh, they're vaguely rememberable. <laughs> rememberable? I guess it's rememberable. Good. Rememberable. Um, I will have to say after Michael told me this, um, I don't know, a few months ago, we've had a lot of Casper conversations over the months, and um, I tried this, and um, didn't work. I could not remember for the life of me <laughs> where the capital D went and where the whatever in this particular thing that I had started, and I had, so then I have like three websites, I had to have them send me the things to reset my password, because I couldn't remember what I did. I personally am a past phrase person. I come up with a phrase and abbreviate it in some way, not necessarily just like the, I would type the whole, I don't like changing my passwords, for example. Um, and uh, and that works pretty well. You have to remember whether or not you use spaces and um, that kind of thing. And that works, that works very well for me. Um, and other people say, well, and that's again where the typeability comes in. You have to be sure that the phrase that you choose can be typed because some things just don't type as well as others do. Um, so I'm actually a passphrase proponent um, just for my personal use because it's a lot easier for me. And you can still add the, you can add numbers, you can mix the case and symbols and whatever. But as you um, as you add, in, in some places it doesn't work very well because they have like a six character limit. So I have like two sets of, I have like two sets of password strategies. I have like the passphrase, which I use anytime I can. And then I also have the other, the little password strategy because I can only use six characters and it has to have a number or it has to have a letter. So then there's kind of like, so I, you may end up having to have two strategies because of that. Yeah. It is rare that you'll you'll pick a password on an account and they'll say your password is too long, but it does happen. Okay. Uh, so I, every once in a while, I actually have to have a shorter password. Yeah. You know, I guess we're kind of this this is about public access computers, so maybe we want to like I guess this is maybe a yeah. point for this, but but you, you can't have a security talk without yeah without the password. Right? Like, <laughs> Um, yeah, we're about halfway through. Does anybody have any questions at this point with anything we covered? Um, just go ahead. Um, oh, text chat. Look at the text chat. Um, but it's so hard to remember them. Okay, so uh, Judy, hopefully we, we've addressed that uh, comment. For I will also throw out, we don't have slides for this. There is software out there that will securely store your passwords. Now, so I have one. I purchased it. It was 30 bucks. There are free ones. Right. But the reason I purchased mine is it will sync to my phone. So as long as I have my phone with me, I have all my passwords. But all of them are stored behind a master password. So I have a completely different password that doesn't relate any way, shape, or form to my typical scenario. And uh, so if I've really forgotten the password and I, I don't have time to do the email me the whole thing, whatever, I can pull out my phone and I can look up a password in my account. As long as I've remembered to put it into the software, I have forgotten periodically. Yes. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's software that can help you uh, with that. Um, okay, so, yeah, okay, not seeing any other questions at this point, I raised hands, why don't we go ahead and get kind of back to the desktop, and this is kind of going to be the, um, but unless, of right. the admin area, do, do you want to start with this one, okay. all right, um, all right, there is a piece of software out there called Windows Steady State, uh, if any of you have gotten any of the recent uh, laptops or desktops from us through the Gates Foundation, you are familiar with this software whether you like it or not um it is free now there are some non-free options that we'll talk about in a moment but windows steady state is completely free it's from microsoft the url is there on the screen and we'll provide bookmarks for all of this after the fact as we usually do um and it allows you to do uh, several things um the main things that would be of concern in this case is the ability to lock profiles and what's called hard disk protection now, additionally, there are all sorts of things where you can stop certain pieces of software from running and, and granularly control what the user can and can't do. Generally, don't recommend going there unless you have very specific needs. Right, you have specific need for it. It's really right. nice that it's there. Hard disk protection and locking profiles tends to do very similar things, works a little differently. Locking profiles, so for example, and I've done this on actual machines, we do this in our lab down in the basement, we have a staff profile, staff login, and a public login. And we've locked the public login. What that means is anything anybody does when their login is public will not be kept past logging out of public. Okay. 
So they can go in, they can change the wallpaper, they can install software, they can do whatever they want, they can change settings. But the moment they log out, it doesn't keep. Okay. Hard disk protection it does that to kind of the next stage. Hard disk protection, if it's turned on, will affect every account on the machine, and anything you do will disappear at reboot, not at logging out. Um, hard disk protection can slow down the boot time of the machine, especially if you especially if you've made changes. Like, yes, because what it has to do is you go you go in, you turn it off, you make your changes, you reboot, and what it does is it makes all the changes permanent. And then when you start up again, it's got to make sure those changes kind of kept. And so it, it can be a bit of a process. But here's the benefit, regardless of which of these two methods you go with, is that you can now let your users run administrator, do whatever the heck they want, and what they think they should be able to do, because that's how their machine at home works. And then once you reboot or you log out, Anything they've done is gone, and you're back to kind of a clean state. You're back to um, uh, the way you, as the library, set up your computers. I like this solution. It takes a little bit of extra work from the administration level, but I like. I think it's a great balance between usability and security. Let them do whatever the heck they want, as long as it's not permanent. And I'd have to say, you know, um, one of the reasons we have public access computers in libraries is for those people who don't have home computers. So those people want to have, we want to offer for them, it would seem to me, as similar an experience to a home computing environment as we can. I mean, I know we've got labs with walls and little cubes and whatever, which, you know, you wouldn't choose to do probably to compute like that at your house, but, you know, okay, we try. Um, I will say, um, a little bit about how the hard disk protection works. It basically takes the whole install. It, it copies. You have to have a lot. It, it requires quite a bit of disk space. It makes a copy of your install. And then every time, then the person, you know, they, every time you reboot, it goes over to that copy and it copies it back. And so that's why it takes a long time, particularly if you've made changes from an administratively, turned off the software, then it says, I gotta make a new copy. So then it has to recopy with the changes. And so that can take a long time. We have had a couple of machines that just kind of refused to do it. They just they had to up, we had to up some RAM to get it to work. And we've had, occasionally we've had a, a bit of a problem, but it still is a great, it is a great solution. And whether you come down on that side of that or the um, lock profiles thing, either one of those to make, a, make it a lot easier to feel comfortable that your patrons are not leaving things behind that are gonna make it difficult for the next person to use the machine. I mean, not, and it's not even so much about malicious stuff, you know, like that's great that it offers some, you know, protection against things that they accidentally do, but you know, they want to try out this or this thus and so product and so they download the demo and what does that change and the next person comes and something doesn't work for them and that's not what we want for the users we want it to work consistently for them and so this is a um this is really a solution that helps with that yeah um i i do want to stress using software like this does kind of add a level of work when it comes to administrating administering the machine i have i have logged into some of the machines done all the updates rebooted and had forgotten to turn off steady state <laughs> and so therefore i had to start over from scratch because all my updates suddenly disappeared but in the long run i think it saw it, it reduces your work because it pretty much eliminates, I will never completely 100% guarantee anything, but pretty much eliminates the ability of users to do serious damage to the machine, which will take you even longer Absolutely. to fix. Um, I have messed with these machines. I have gone in and said, format the hard drive. And it said, hard drive format it, I don't work anymore. You reboot it and it came back. I mean, I, now don't do that with the machine you really rely on, do that with a spare machine. Mm -hmm. But I've done it and the software does work. You know, the, as advertised. Um, 
We will throw in that there are non-free options. Um, I have had experience with deep freeze. Um, it's uh, basically you're going to buy it. It's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks easily, depending on uh, how many machines you have. I do find that it worked. Um, I think it was a little more easier to use than steady state. Um, you know, it was just it was turn on and off with a password. You didn't have to reboot. It it, it, it was a little uh, faster of a process to update things, but you get what you pay for. Uh, so you you are going to pay for that. Centurion Guard is what's on all of those old Gates machines, if you have any of those gateways uh, from the Gates Foundation. Uh, and Centurion has a software version, but then also has the hardware version, which is the physical key that some of you have on the front of your computers. Okay. And that makes it even easier, that key. I mean, you literally you, you turn the key to unlock, you do all your updates, you reboot, and you lock it again. No passwords to remember, physical key, very easy, but it's going to cost you even more uh, to be able to do that. So, um, you know, if you if you got the spare cash, look into it. But I'm guessing most of us don't at this point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If he, oh, we have a question. Uh, Judy, you want to go ahead? Uh, I just u used, uh, just installed a new public access and put the Centurion Guard software on called Smart Shield. And uh, relatively inexpensive, and so far been running for about 60 days, and I'm really, really pleased with it. Great. Yeah. Okay. So the is so Centurion Guard software program is called. I'm sorry. Could you say the name of it again? It's called Smart Shield. Smart Shield. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, and it's working. So there we have a recommendation for that. So great. Uh, thank you very much. And well, in terms of cost. Yeah. And Krista, thank you for pointing out that there was a hand raised. <laughs> Sometimes we miss things on the screen here. Um, so we've pretty much answered this question. I really think that uh, if you have something like this installed, you can let your public run as admin. Um, you know, you do want to make sure that they can't get to shared drives on the network. Uh, you know, right? We're talking about that's, autonomous that's, public access computers. Right. If exactly. They're, if they're if they're in any way shared with your network, then I think that's a whole different set of solutions. Right. Um, but yeah, your 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 machine your your public access machine should not be able to access the circ system anyway. Right. So uh, I, I think you're 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 probably good there. So yeah, I I think you that you can. And when we say steady state there on the slide, we also mean the deep freeze and the centurion right th those other packages also um i do want to take the opportunity to uh talk about antivirus um i would thought a different slide was next so that's why i'm stumbling here just a little bit <laughs> um that's all right we'll get to that slide in a few minutes um but yeah so we need to talk about antivirus basically have antivirus software on all of your computers desktop laptop staff machines, public machines, uh, you just need it. Um, I think there was a study done recently, if you took a brand new Windows computer out of the box, hadn't installed any updates yet, put it on the internet, it would be compromised in like 10 minutes or less. Or it's amazing. Like um, so, you know, antivirus is not necessarily going to be perfect, but you're going to uh, want it anyways. And you want to make sure it's kept up to date. Absolutely. That, you, no question. And usually that's a weekly thing. Um, although I've seen some antivirus software practically update itself daily. So, sure. you know, go for it. Um, there are some free options out there. I'm losing Diane. You are losing me because okay. I just knocked over my coffee cup. Uh-oh. Is, uh -oh. It, is it have coffee I in it? It did, but not, it also had the lid. Well, okay. We're not staining the carpet. Anyways. No, no. Um, okay, so well. we got, we've got three <laughs> free options today. here, uh, and uh, I have used all three of these, and I recommend all three of these. However, whether you can legally use all three of these for free is also another issue. Okay, the first one, the one I am using personally on my machines is called ClamWin. Um, it is free. It is open source, which I like. I like to support the open source stuff. However, there is kind of a catch. It doesn't have what's called real-time scanning. Um, so in other words, I can hit a button and it will scan my computer. I can um, schedule it to scan my computer at certain times. However, if I download something off the internet and save it, it will not scan it as it's coming in. 
Um, but it, it will if you can right click and scan it yourself. But right manually. before I run it, I can right click and I can scan it manually. Um, so on like my computers, where I like to think I really know what I'm doing and I'm paying attention and I don't don't lo download random stuff from places I don't know and you know attachments, I run Clamwin. Uh, you don't the, have a, do you don't have a, have seven thousand emoti emoticon programs? No, I do not have seven thousand emoticon programs. Now, the fifteen year old in my house, she does not have Clamwin. She has something that will scan stuff on real time I because. Should. Um, because you know, those seem to be irresistible. I have she, no idea. She will download all sorts of random stuff. Although she, she, she's actually much better than I make it sound out to be. But anyways, um, so there you go. The other two, which I have used, and probably most of you have heard of this next one, AVG Free. Um, it is free for home. And I will also point out Avast is listed as free for home. Uh, you download it, you install it, you run it, it updates itself, it does real-time scanning, it does scheduled full system scanning, they, they do everything that the expensive paid-for software will do. However, a library is not a home. Um, but I know of libraries that have just downloaded the free version and are using it anyway, because what are your chances of being caught? I'm not recommending this, I'm just saying. Um, so we leave that up to you. Um, beyond that, you get into the pay for stuff. Your Nortons, your Symantex, your McAfee. Um, there's many others out there. Um, and to be really honest, some of them are not high, are not hugely expensive. It's not it's not like it's un, unfathomable to pay for your virus protection. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not. And um, to go to go with something that is. I don't know. I I tend to appreciate the more minimally invasive ones, the ones that Not require Norton. require the least amount the, the least amount of um, you know disk space. That the, the sort of lowest system requirements um, tend to be the ones that aren't going to try to run your life, which mm -hmm. and um, sometimes the more um, what would they say um, I don't know the the bigger programs tend to have, uh, with all the whistles, yeah, they tend to be resource hogs. They slow stuff down, and some stuff just won't run with them. Mm -hmm. So if you look at if you have a if you look at an FAQ for a program you're installing, and there'll be trouble to say, well, you might have to uninstall this, or is your virus protection that, or or those kinds of things. So those are things you do need to think about. Yeah, the two things I will say, getting a little outside of, um, the first one gets a little outside of your public desktops, but there's absolutely no reason to pay for antivirus software in your home. Use one of these three, honestly. There's awesome. Just, there, there's no reason to pay a subscription fee. There's no reason to pay for the software. Just do it. They make their money off of the companies that have to pay for it. So, I mean, really. Um, the other thing I will say is never have two different antivirus programs on the same computer. You do not get double the protection. What usually ends up happening is they, they start reporting each other as viruses, and it gets really messy very quickly. So if you're using something like McAfee that came with your computer, you want to stop paying for it, make sure you uninstall it first, get rid of it, then install one of the free ones because yeah. they, they will conflict with each other very quickly and very nastily. Um, so I've, I've had to clean up machines that had multiple antivirus software on it, and it just wasn't pretty. Um, ah, this is the slide I was expecting a few minutes ago. Um, I have heard people report, and I've read articles that said, well, if I'm running something like Steady State, if I catch a virus, all I have to do is reboot the computer, and the virus is gone. So therefore, I don't need to run any virus software. Um, that is factually accurate, but leaves out some important concepts. In other words, Steady State and the like does not eliminate the need for you to run antivirus software. Because the idea is antivirus software will prevent you from catching it in the first place. If, you, if it gets past your antivirus software, then getting rid of it's easy by rebooting if you have something like steady state. But unfortunately, there might be, a, there might be hours between the time where you catch it and where you reboot your computer to get rid of it. And who knows what it's doing to not just your computer, but other computers, right. maybe not even in your building. It could be during that six-hour period spamming itself out through your network connection 
um, and doing damage to completely other people, you know, other people's computers until you reboot. So you really still want the antivirus software to prevent things from, like that from happening between the time you possibly caught it and you reboot it by preventing you from catching it in the first place. It's really a thing you do to be a good citizen. Yes, yeah. good etiquette. It's your good, it's your good citizen thing that you do. You make sure that your machine is not going to be doing bad things to other machines for mm -hmm. any length of time. Yep. Um, two more slides here, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, phishing or anti-phishing. Phishing is those wonderful, you get the email that says your bank account has been compromised. Click on this link to go to US Bank and log into your account to, to fix the problem. And unfortunately, uh, us uh, librarians and patrons will fall for this periodically. Sure. Um, please don't. Your you know bank will never provide you a hyperlink to log into your account because what ends up happening is you get to another website that isn't your bank. It just looks like it, uh, and then you type in your username and your password. Well, this has become such a problem that most browsers have built-in anti-phishing features. And what we've done here on the left is we've pointed out where it is in the settings for Firefox. And on the right, we've pointed out where it is in the settings in Internet Explorer 7. I don't know if it's changed in 8. It's going to look about the same. Yeah, it's going to look about the same. I believe they are on by default. You want to make yes. sure they're on. This will not prevent any and all phishing from happening, but there are lists of known sites that get added quite regularly, updated quite regularly. And so if you get to one of these sites, you know, the screen will kind of go black and a big announcement will come up saying, this is a suspected bad site. Are you sure you want to be here? Yes or no? And typically you say, no, I'm not sure I want to be here. And it will take you off to like Google or something like that. It will, it will warn you of that. And I think that would be a good, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to do for your patrons if nothing else. Uh, because I get those reports of patrons coming into the library going, it says I won a million dollars, will you help me get my money? Um, you know, and then we get into, have to explain to them that no, you didn't win a million dollars from Nigeria. So, um, and then last but not least, um, some privacy issues you may want to deal with on your computers. Um, web browsers and computers are designed for one person to one computer, really. I mean, yes, you can have multiple logins and things like that, but what they're not designed for is what we're making them do in a public access situation, which is thousands of people using the same computer. And so there are privacy concerns that are not issues in the home. Your browser keeps a history of where people have been. Your browser keeps copies of pages that uh, people have visited called the cache. And your password, your your browser by default typically remembers people's usernames and passwords. We highly suggest you turn these features off <laughs> before for privacy issues. Um, you know, data that you don't have can't be requested by somebody, whether legitimately or illegitimately. Um, um, data that's not there will not be viewed by the next person who uses the machine. Right. So what we generally suggest is in your browser settings. And if you're using something like a steady state, do this while it's turned off. Find the history settings, set it to zero. You have no reason that. Do you advise why, uh, okay, I, <laughs> hi Deborah. Um, I see the question down there in the text chat. We'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. Um, well, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's gonna be an interesting conversation. Anyways, um, zero the history. There is absolutely no reason a public access machine, in my opinion, should keep keeping a history. I mean, really. Nope. You, you don't need to know, your patrons don't need to know who visited what, where, and when. Useful on my desk, but not in a public right. machine. The cache. Now you can set the cache to zero. There's kind of a, a downside to this, however. Um, the cache is there to make sure that the browser runs a lot more smoothly. Because if it's the, you know, when you hit the back button, it's not necessarily reading the page off the internet again, it's reading it off your hard drive, it's reading it off the cache. So turning off the cache does actually slow down your surfing experience. However, you can set it really small. You can set it for like 10 megabytes or something like that, or five megabytes. Usually it's measured in gigabytes these days with really large hard drives. Right. You don't need to store that much information, okay? And then zero it. So then when you do reboot, if you're running something like steady state, it's back to zero every time you reboot it. Um, and the password memory, really, there's absolutely no reason for that. Just turn it off, 
then the the um, the browser won't even ask the user if they want their password to be memorized. There's just zero reason for people to on a public machine to have the browser remember their bank account password. It's just not needed. Turn it off. Did I have uh, any nope, opinions that's pretty on that much, one? Nope. That's we, exactly we, that's exactly why we put up that slide. We agree. Just, <laughs> you know. All right, um, so we have a question. I'm, I have a feeling this is a loaded question, but we didn't ask anybody to ask this. Uh, do you advise watching the public access PCs or, uh, to watch for users looking at porn or other unwanted sites? Okay, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, this is my opinion. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, I gotta say, I'm on the, the left end of opinion here. Uh, I say it is none of the library's business. Uh, to do that is not our job to be police officers. It is a policy issue. You, you do need to have some sort of written policy on this. I am not saying that you shouldn't deal with issues as they arise. Should another patron complain or should you walk by them and notice something? But I am I personally am foursquare against kind of an active intentional monitoring of what people are doing on the computers on the part of library staff. Um, we, most of us, many of us in public libraries are government entities. That is not our job. And I will stress again, this is my personal opinion on this issue. And basically I'd have to say that's probably why I was hoping this wouldn't come up. Because, <laughs> because I think that it is, it is such a horribly loaded issue. And it's really... Um, it's really difficult and having a policy is important community standards are important and and you know no one wants people to be um exposed to things that they would find offensive no one wants to promote that and on the other hand um one of the things we're trying to do is to allow people whose income does not allow them to have a computer in the privacy of their home the ability to do the things they would do in the privacy of their home. So then again, that makes it kind of none of our business. So I think it is a policy issue. I think that it's very, that it is important that a library, a librarian and the board have a policy and that you're able to demonstrate that you have this policy and abide by it and that your staff is, is agreeing with it. Um, but like I said, I, I tend to be on on the same page with Michael in that, it, which is that um, it's really not any of our business. But then again, that's my opinion. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't represent any advice that um, this agency is giving to librarians <laughs> in the state. So um, that's why it's not on a slide anywhere, and it wasn't anything that we planned to talk about. Yeah. Um, we have another uh, request. In the interest of time, I'm not going to actually show this on the video, uh, but it's it's how do you we do that browser privacy stuff in Internet Explorer? I will tell you, it's very simple. You go to Tools and then Internet Options, and on the General tab under Browsing History, there is a button labeled Delete. You click on that delete button, it will say, what do you want to delete? It will give you a whole bunch of options, such as the history and the cache and the whatever, and that will clear it out. There's also a settings button, which will allow you to say how long you want to keep the memory, how much disk space do you want to set aside to that. Basically set those to either very small numbers or to zero, which would be a very, very small number. Um, so tools, internet options, general tab, and then it's right there under browsing history are the two buttons available to you uh, to change those options. Firefox, very similar. It's under tools, internet options, and I think there's a uh, there's a history tab and a privacy tab I think that like you that, want to take yeah. a look at. So those are available to you. Um, we are running short on time. We're, we've got about two minutes left here officially, although we can go a little long. Um, we've only recorded 15 minutes. Oh, but, okay, well... Uh, all right, we've got time. Uh, do any does anybody else have any other questions? If you want to just type it in the text chat, you can do that. Um, if you uh, have the mic and want to ask it via audio, just go ahead and give a quick hand raise so we can call on you and mute our mic while you're talking. 
Um, I will throw in while we're waiting to see if we have any that uh, starting in May, I know there's one scheduled in North Platte. Uh, I am doing some policy workshops coming up. So uh, watch the training calendar for that uh, throughout the rest of this year. And Dana, you have a question. So why don't we have you go first and then we'll have uh, Deb ask her question. Did you mute our mic? Uh, Dana, do you have a mic? You'll just want to hold down your control key while you're talking. Okay, Dana, we're not hearing from you, so why don't you go ahead and type it in the text chat. In the meanwhile, uh, I, I, I'm not ignoring you, but uh, Deb, do you have a question uh, via audio? Yes, I do, Michael. Um, I have been having a problem with my old Gates machine. Um, I have tried doing several updates. When I try to do an update um, on with updating Internet Explorer to go to number seven, it see it I can't. It really makes a mess of my machine. I can't connect uh, to the internet. Uh, do you have any suggestions to what might be the problem with this? Mm, simple answer, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Um... Uh, I, I do recall hearing that there were some problems with some older equipment going up to Internet Explorer 7. Um, but, okay, Chris is saying she had that problem at home. Um, were you able to solve it at home? I bought a new computer. Bought a new computer. Chris, Chris okay. bought a new computer. Had, that yeah, was her solution. I had a computer that was, I don't know, maybe four years old, and I had the same thing. I would try to, every time I tried to install Explorer, it just wouldn't make the computer itself not work, but Explorer would just not work. I would click on the icon, and it wouldn't do anything. So I had to back down to six um, and just deal. Because okay. I, I didn't go through the trouble of figuring out why. I just, well, six works, fine. I'll just do that yeah. for now. And then just recently I bought a new one. And, Okay. Um, I, I have two suggestions. Do you have a comment first? No, I was going to say I certainly can look it up and see if we can find a, see if there is an answer to that out there. Right. Well, it, my two suggestions. Um, suggestion number one is maybe try updating the Internet Explorer 8, uh, which has been out a little less than a month, to skip 7 completely. Um, I the default assumption would be if 7 won't run, why would 8 run? Well, they changed it might. A lot. <laughs> they, they changed a they lot between 7 and 8. Um, so that might be your option there. Um, IE6 is pretty insecure. Uh, it's That's really old software. It was out there for years before they updated to 7. It was almost like 6 years or something like that. Which is why I wanted to um, yeah, which is why you should not be using IE6 right. anymore. Um, the other general option... Uh, I might suggest is if 8 won't work, um, install Firefox and set that as your default browser. Um, you know, you can't get rid of IE, right. but you could use something else instead so that when somebody clicks on a hyperlink or opens the internet, you know, just wants to go to the internet in general, they're not using the less secure browser, which would be IE6. That's true. Um, you know, other than the fact, I think Firefox is a better browser anyway. Um, there's so you can check marks when you say so that. Michael. How often? I've only how I think I've said it twice. Um, Jan is suggesting in the chat uh, that the problem might be with Service Pack two or three. In my experience, yeah. Um, are you up to date on the service packs on that machine? Might be another thing. Uh, XP, which those Gates machines were running, is up to Service Pack three. Um, but I, honestly, I think my first try right now would be to uh, try installing Internet Explorer eight. Uh, I, I think that would probably be the easiest thing to try at this point. Well, checking your service packs first because you well, really do want to have you those should service be packs you up should again. be up to date with your service packs. Also, I mean that that's also a security issue that you, you want to make sure you're up to date there. So, um, Dana, if you want to ask your question, if you don't have a microphone, there's a text chat button in the top of your interface. If you click on that, a new window will pop up where you can type in your question. It's a separate window from the main center interface. And if we're just confused and you're having no problems, we apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really? Um, so, anybody else have any other questions or comments for the benefit of the group? All right, I don't see any. Um, our email addresses are up there on the screen. We got some applause. 
Um, I want to know if malware bytes rates well. Uh, actually, I've heard of malware bytes. I have not used it, but I have not heard any bad things about it. So um, there's that. Uh, yeah, we didn't really talk about malware. Um, mm -hmm. There's also the uh, Microsoft Malicious Software Removal Tool, uh, MSRT, sure. which is also pretty good. Uh, I have used something called AdAware. Um, I've that. used SpyBot Search and Destroy. These are all free. I have recently heard about malware bytes, and, and I, it was a, a general recommendation, as I recall. So, um, I guess one thing I do, I think this, I'm glad you brought this uh, to our attention, though, because one thing is um, a lot of times you'll be surfing around the internet and you will see something that says, you know, we're sensing that your machine is um, infested with the spyware. Click here to remove the whatever. Don't and do I don't ever. <laughs> Ever do that don't ever do that please don't ever do that yes. um, in fact there's there's a piece if you if there's a piece of software if you want if you want to know then go out and find a piece of software that is reviewed that has recommendations install that piece of software to check your computer yep. don't ever just click here yeah in fact there is a piece of malicious software out there called antivirus 2009 <laughs> It, it, it markets itself as antivirus software, and it itself is malicious. So, um, yeah, the, the, the blinking ads on the screen, no website knows that you have malicious software installed just by going to the website. So anytime you see something advertised or promoted or whatever, go online. You know, look it up. See what people are saying about it. See what the reviews are. See what it's... See what its limitations are. Um, for example, like um, the free program Clam one. If you want, if you were expecting it to actively scan every new file that you brought in, if you didn't know that, you would think that that was happening, but, but it isn't. So do read about whatever it is that you're thinking about installing. Find out what people are saying about it. You know, are the are the comments from places that are reputable? I mean, is it CNET? Is it PC World? Is it you know places that you know? Mm -hmm. so. And I'll just throw one last thing in case we have any like seriously geeky people in, in the room and you really <laughs> want to learn a lot of this stuff and you got some time. There's a great podcast called Security Now. Um, I will, however, readily admit half of it is over my head. But I always learn something. <laughs> I, I, I have pulled more stuff out of that podcast than for my security workshops and presentations like this than anywhere else. Um, the guys that run it know exactly what they're talking about. It's easy to understand, but it is very kind of high level. They talk about mm -hmm. encryption and, and all these other things. But I love it. So, you know, if you want to give it a shot, it's out there. Just Google security now. <laughs> I think we're going to have to wrap things up for okay. an hour. Um, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Um, if you do have other questions, I'll put you in here. Um, <laughs> you guys know where to find Michael and Diane. Email them, call the commission, whatever. They can help you with anything you may be doing. Um, are you getting some applause? Hey. <laughs> well, well, we'll try to help you. <laughs> <laughs> really. And hopefully you'll join us next week um, for Encompass Live. Our topic will be Nebraska memories. Yay. Great. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Cool. Bye. 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 -bye.